Independent Black Media, 900 AM, 96.1 FM, WURD, WURDradio.com. Listen live anytime and log on. If you don't have that app, you know where to go. Download an app like you know. I hope that you are all having a productive and a blessed day. Uh, what's it, Wednesday? A beautiful Wednesday. If you're at your job, if you're in, on the road, if you're at home, if you're retired, if you're, if you're on your bed of affliction, if you're just trying to overcome an addiction, if you're, you know, just getting done arguing with somebody you're no business arguing with or if you're having one of the best days ever and living your best life we are shouting you out whatever you're going through i want you to know that wurd is here for you and it is uh, a magnificent responsibility because i used to i used to hear people talk about what they heard on the radio and and what they saw on tv and i remember the the investment that the community had with such information because i think when the statistics were talking about how much tv people watch you know we're always really high up on that list of people that watch tv and listen to the radio and uh, absorb and ingest pop culture even with facebook and twitter you know they were saying that twitter and some of them was like ailing until black twitter really started popping so we disproportionately use these social media sites and disproportionately listen to the radio and, and watch television so if you involved in television or radio or media and you African American just know that your community is watching you more than most other communities watch them at this time Dr. Anthony Montero Year Du Bois when you call in let's have a Year Du Bois question 215-634-8065 again that's 215-634-8065 or toll free 866-361-0900 turn it over to Dr. Anthony Montero Year Du Bois thank you professor Smith, it's good to be here with you in Coesa. You know, in uh, 1895, Booker T. Washington gave a historic speech in Atlanta known as the Atlanta Compromise Speech. And in it, he uh, called upon black folk to put your buckets down where you are, literally to stop fighting for civil rights and for the right to vote, all of which were supposedly guaranteed uh, in the Constitution under the 14th and 15th Amendments. Now, following upon Washington's speech uh, in 1896, the uh, Supreme Court decided in the landmark a uh, Plessy versus Ferguson decision that whiteness was a protected category. In other words, the doctrine known as whiteness as property was uh, uh, developed. And uh, what that meant is that if anything uh, infringed upon the privileges of white people that it would be considered illegal and hence black civil rights and black voting rights were considered uh, uh, illegal if they infringed upon white people and thus arose the doctrine of separate and equal which in substance meant uh, separate and unequal. So uh, today I'm going to read from a chapter from the Souls of Black Folk entitled <clears throat> of Mr. Booker T. Washington and others. And I'm going to start mm, somewhere about halfway uh, through uh, the essay, and Du Bois says the following. <clears throat> Before 1750, while the fire of African freedom still burned in the veins of the slaves, there was in all leadership or attempted leadership but the one motive of revolt and revenge, typified in the terrible Maroons, the Dutch blacks, and Cato of Stono, the great rebellion of Africans in South Carolina in 1739, and veiling all of the Americas in fear of insurrection, the liberalizing tendencies of the latter half of the 18th century, the 1700s, brought along with kindlier relations between black and white thoughts of ultimate adjustment and assimilation. Such aspiration was especially voiced in the earnest poems of Phyllis Wheatley, in the martyrdom of Crispus Attox, in the fighting of Salem and Poor, the intellectual accomplishments of Banneger and Durham, and the political demands of Paul Cuffey. 
Stern financial and social stress after the war cooled much of the previous humanitarian ardor, the disappointment and impatience of the Negroes at the persistence of slavery and serfdom voiced itself in two movements. The slaves in the South, aroused undoubtedly by vague rumors of the Haitian Revolution, made three fierce attempts at insurrection in 1800 under Gabriel Prosser in Virginia, in 1822 under Denmark Vesey in Carolina, and in 1831 again in Virginia under the terrible Nat Turner. In the free states, on the other hand, a new and curious attempt at development was made. In Philadelphia and New York, color, prescription, and prejudice led to a withdrawal of Negro a communicants from the white churches and the formation of a peculiar socio-religious institution among the Negroes known as the African Church, an organization still living and controlling in its various branches over a million men and women. David Walker's wild appeal against the trend of the times showed how the world was changing after the coming of the cotton gin. By 1830, slavery seemed helplessly fastened on the South, and the slaves thoroughly cowed into submission. The free Negroes of the North, inspired by the mulatto immigrants from the West Indies, began to change the basis of their demands. They recognized the slavery of the slaves, but insisted that they themselves were free men and sought assimilation and amalgamation with the nation on the same terms with other men. Thus, Fortin and Purvis of Philadelphia, Shad of Wilmington, Du Bois of New Haven, Barbados of Boston, and others strove singly and together as men. They said, not as slaves, as people of color, not as Negroes. The trend of the times, however, refused them recognition, save in individual and exceptional cases, considered them as one with all the despised blacks, and they soon found themselves striving to keep even the rights they formerly had of voting and working and moving as free men. Schemes of migration and colonization arose among them, but they, but they refused to entertain and they eventually turned to the abolitionist movement as a final refu refuge. Here led by Ramon, Nell, Wells Brown, and Frederick Douglass, a new period of self-assertion and self development dawn. To be sure, ultimate freedom and assimilation were the ideal before the leaders, but the assertion of the manhood rights of the Negro by himself was the main reliance, and John Brown's raid was the extreme of its logic. After the war, and emancipation, the great form of Frederick Douglass, the greatest of American Negro leaders, still led the host. Self-assertion, especially in political lines, was the main program, and behind Douglass came Elliot, Bruce, and Langston, and the Reconstruction politicians, and less conspicuous, but of great social significance, Alexander Cromell and Bishop Daniel Payne. Mr. Washington, however, represents in Negro thought the old attitude of adjustment and submission. <clears throat> and then Du Bois continues pointing out that Booker T. Washington's program was beset by a triple paradox or triple contradiction. And here's what Du Bois says. This triple paradox in Mr. Washington's position is the object of criticism by two classes of black Americans. One class is spiritually descended from Toussaint Louverture, the savior, through Gabriel Prosser, Denmark Vesey, and Nat Turner, and they represent the attitude of revolt and revenge. They hate the white South blindly and distrust the white man generally, and so far as they agree on definite action, they think the Negro's only hope lies in emigration beyond the borders of the United States. And yet, 
By the irony of fate, nothing has more effectively made this program seem hopeless than the recent course of the United States towards weaker and darker peoples in the West Indies, Hawaii, and and the Philippines. For where now in the world may we go and escape the brutality of the white man? The other class of Negroes who cannot agree with Mr. Washington has hitherto said little out loud. They deprecate the sight of scattered councils of internal disagreement that are made public, and especially they dislike making their just criticisms of a useful and earnest man, Booker T. Washington, an excuse for a general discharge of venom from small-minded opponents. And then finally, Du Bois concludes, in failing thus to state plainly and unequivocally the legitimate demands of their people, even at the cost of opposing an honored leader like Booker T. Washington, the thinking classes of American Negroes would shirk a heavy responsibility, a responsibility to themselves, a responsibility to the struggling masses, a responsibility to the darker races of men whose future depends so largely on the American Negro, but especially a responsibility even to this nation, the common fatherland. It is wrong to encourage a man or a people in evil doing. It is wrong to aid and abet a national crime simply because it is unpopular not to do so. The growing spirit of kindliness and reconciliation between the North and South after the frightful difference of a generation ago ought to be a source of deep congratulations to all, and especially to those whose mistreatment caused the Civil War in the first place. But if that reconciliation is to be marked by the industrial slavery and civic death and lack of voting power of those same black men with permanent legislation into a position of inferiority than those black men if they are really men and women are called upon by every consideration of patriotism and nationalism and loyalty to oppose such a course by all civilized means even though such opposition involves disagreement with Booker T. Washington. We have no right to sit silently by while the inevitable seeds are sown for a harvest of disaster to our children, black and white. Make sure you call up for the boys' question, and 215-634-8065 is the number. If you want to call toll-free, 1-866-361-0900. Again, 215-634-8065, or toll-free, 1-866-361-0900. You want to take a break first, question, and come back with the phone lines? We'll do that. That way we give people a nice amount of time to talk, do boys' talk. I'm Aaron Smith. She's Queen Quays, the super producer in the year, Du Bois, and you. I'm waking up with words, y'all. Seems like everything has a day. There's even a National Cheesesteak Day, which, come on, that's pretty much every day here. But AARP in Philadelphia thinks today should be your day. So come meet new people at free movie screenings and festivals, or help make a difference by volunteering with us. Whatever you decide to do, we got you. We're here in our community helping you make the most of it. So take on today and every day. Cheesesteak in hand with AARP. Learn how at aarp.org slash Philadelphia. Was that a contraction? Will I have a private room? Should I deliver with a doctor or a midwife? Can I try for a VBAC? How much weight should I be gaining? Is there a doctor on site? Is it time to push? How am I supposed to fit all of these appointments in? Can I still exercise? From prenatal care through delivery to postpartum support, including our level 3 NICU for babies needing extra care. When you have questions, Einstein Maternity Care has answers. Make your appointment at 1-800-EINSTEIN. Hey, Brother Shamari. 
I hear you talking about JD's auto body and painting. That's where I go. Nick, I know the owner, JD, personally, and they always take care of me. You asked me. I told you about JD's when you needed car repairs. I've been spreading the word about their professional work. I know. I know. I remember now. You sure did. They're at 6300 Wayne Avenue in Germantown, right? 215-848-5949. That's 215-848-5949. I know. I have it memorized. Now, we both agree that JD's Auto Body and Painting is the place to take your car for all your auto body repair and painting needs. They work with all insurance companies and free towing with repairs. Yeah, free estimates and senior discounts, too. But I bet you didn't know JD's has a 10% discount for WURD listeners. Come on, Nick. I know why I need a JD's wife since elementary school. Tell them Brother Shamari sent you, and you can mention Nick, too. Yeah, that's right. Call JD's today at 215-848-5949. Listening to Wake Up With Word on Word Radio, 96.1 FM and 900 AM WURD, Independent Black Media. Independent Black Media, 900 AM, 96.1 FM, WURD, WURDradio.com. Listen live anytime and log on. If you don't have that app, you know where to go. Download an app like you know. At this time of the show, you know what we do. We go to the phone lines here at Du Bois. Brother Timothy from South Philly, you're waking up with Word. Dr. Smith, how are you, sir? Doing well, doing well. Good. Dr. Montero, how are you, sir? Fine, sir. How are you today? Very good. Kowasa, how are you, man? I'm good. Thank you so much for asking. Yes, uh, Dr. Montero. Yes, sir. Yes, when it comes to going against uh, Booker T. Washington Atlanta address, he had a person for making the verse with him, 1870, Archibald Grimke. Oh, yes, yes. Public speaker, Lincoln man. And also, I believe it was his brother, Francis Gimpy. He was, uh, had a church called the uh, 50th Street Presbyterian uh, Church in Washington, D.C. My question, their position, they, they formulated the, uh, the Niagara Movement with the boys. Mm-hmm. What was their position in going against uh, the Atlanta Address? Well, you know, the... Um uh, the Niagara Movement itself, which was formed, uh, as you point out, and I think it's a brilliant point that you're making, which was formed in 1905, uh, was uh, seen as an organization to oppose the Atlanta Compromise uh, that Booker T. Washington had made. And, of course, we, we now know that the, uh, that the Niagara Movement was the first actual civil rights movement among oppressed people uh, in the world, in the modern world. So that's what the uh, the Niagara Movement was about. It was formed in uh, 1905, in fact, two years after the publication of The Souls of Black Folk. Mr. Montero, yes. are you telling me that, um, as I'm trying to understand, if Booker T. Washington was not for people who were oppressed? His machine was the, one of the best things that the African American had at that present time. Well, and you know that's the point of uh, of dispute and the point of discussion, uh, whether or not the policies of compromise, which went along. Uh, in essence, with the Supreme Court's landmark decision, uh, Plessy v. Ferguson, which, up, which upheld the idea that whiteness was protected by the Constitution, and if black civil rights or black voting rights uh, would upset the privileges of white people, then they would have to be uh, dispensed with. Now, while that decision was nominally overturned in 1954 with the Brown versus the Board of Education decision. In essence, the notion of white privilege as protected continues in the United States. I would say, and this, uh, I don't know that we have the time to get into every detail of this, I think that the Booker T. Washington compromise turned out to be a great uh, error, a great mistake. And I think Du Bois and the people who met at Niagara Falls in uh, 1905 were, were right to stand up to it. Also, we have Jamila from Illinois on the line. Thank you for waking up with word. Yes, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Um, good morning. So to the point that you're just making, and and, and um, a little bit before where you were um, sharing sort of 
the the Niagara movement being one of the first civil rights movements in the world, I would like to sort of link this to a current experience Mm -hmm. and wanting to get insight as to um, your perspective on what Du Bois writes with what's happening in France right now with the Yellow Vest. What would a Du Boisian um, sort of thought or, or theorist say in regards to what's happening, what the role of um, sort of black people in this country should be in observing what's happening in France? Because um, I feel like the, the Washington perspective that we've sort of adopted has been to just look domestically and and it's not the black person's role to have an opinion of what's happening internationally but i would be curious to get wow. a du Boisian perspective from that <laughs> yeah that that's very kind of you to ask such a question and to make such a point which is very important and you know from the time that du bois was a pan-africanist starting in 1900 by the way up until you know his uh four congresses Pan-Africanist Congresses in in the 1920s, up until his death, he remained an internationalist, and he always argued, because of the transatlantic slave trade, and because we were brought here from Africa, and therefore had our, uh, so to speak, political and civilizational feet in two worlds, the world of Africa and the, the African independence movements and the world of the struggle for democracy in the West, including the United States. Now, in that respect, he saw after World War II, and he wrote this in his third, bi- I mean, History of Africa, entitled The World in, uh, in Africa, that Europe was collapsing. And I think if it were true in 1946, with uh, over 70 years later, in 2008, it is more true today. Europe is in free fall, political and civilizational collapse. And it's not just France. It is also England and um, and Italy and Germany and at the same time we see the rise of Asia. So I think that's kind of the way that Du Bois would begin to look at such events and he would be quite interested in their logic and their outcomes. We also have Madeline Dunn from Overbrook on the line. Thank you, Madeline, for waking up with word. Thank you for taking this call. You guys have got me so, because several things that I have seen and read this week, Tony fits right into your stuff. Tony. Thank you, Madeline. How are you? The number, thank you, darling. I'm fine. And your family? Fine, thank you. The number one scholar (laughs) for divorce in America. Tony. Yes. I was going to ask you now. I need more than a minute this morning, brother. Please. Please, King. You got it. Thank you. Number one, I was all set to to just give you a general blah, blah, blah. But these things happen. The thing in France, uh, our king just told us this morning that to the people downtown, that we, he's setting us up for the same thing right here in America. Mm. He's setting it up, brother, because what's going on in Philadelphia is going on all across this country. He's setting it up, and if they don't bring it in and put that money into the school district, how are you going to make somebody who took $4,000, they want her to go to jail, and they let them take $42 million off of a deal right here in Philadelphia when our schools don't have nurses every day, counselors every day. There's nobody to help our children who have trauma just because of being here in America. Is that right? I agree with you 100%. Now, let me just take it. That was arrested because she was making bombs, the stuff that she bought. You know what she said? She said that when... That man killed them people in the church in Charleston, Mm -hmm. she decided she needed to get in and help that situation out. This was a young white woman, a professional, and I read it and I thought, no, she did say that. 
Look, Satan is busy in many forms, mm -hmm. in many, many forms. Let me let me say, and and thank you very much for those observations, uh, Madeline. It's it's great to hear your voice. You are absolutely right. Uh, the United States is on the cusp. Of rebellion. There was a famous American historian back in the 1950s and 60s, and his name was Arthur Schlesinger, and he had this concept of the vital center. As long as the center held, America could be governed. If the center collapses, the a possibility of governing the United States through democratic consensus would also collapse. And what we have now, are, and what we are now witnessing, let me say, is the consequences of the collapse of the center and the gravitation, especially among white folk, to the two extremes. I think uh, we cannot rule out uh, events that looks similar to what is happening in France right now. The only difference is that white America is so heavily armed and so heavily, uh, so uh, deeply committed to using violence to resolve all of their problems. But I agree with you. Uh, Philadelphia also, as you point out, how can we give tax breaks and tax abatements to developers who are developing downtown to people who want to build stadiums close to black neighborhoods in North Philadelphia, to universities who do not pay property taxes and allow our children not to be educated, to look at all of this poverty and our young men and women who don't have jobs, who don't have education. You are absolutely right. We are on a tinderbox. So thank you, Madeline. And thank you for waking up with word, Madeline, Jamila, and Brother Timothy. There's still a couple minutes to call in, 215-634-8065, 215-634-8065, a toll-free 1-866-361-0900. In the meantime, I see you brought some guests with you today, yes. Dr. Montero, if you want to give them some time as well, that'd be, be good right now. And Professor Smith, I think you met them before. Yes. These are my two, uh, not, not my personal twins, but they're twins <laughs> in the free school, Jacob and Serafina, they're uh, sophomores at Temple University, and they're artists, He's, he does acting and reads, you know, Othello like Paul Robeson and Lorraine Hansberry, and she's a singer and a painter, and she can sing Nina Simone and Aretha Franklin, so I have them, you all want to say anything? Or sing anything. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> you want to sing, Serafina? Uh, well, first off, good morning. Good Everybody. morning. <laughs> How's it going? Um. <laughs> they, they're not ready to perform right now. I, mean, I could if you want to hear some Oh, Othello go ahead. Reading. Please, please. Othello, um, maybe. Yeah, yeah. I, I'll just uh, introduce it first. Um, <laughs> um, so, uh, Othello is the Shakespeare story about the, the, um, the Moor in Venice. Right, the the African um, general in um, uh, Venice, and he, you know, he he has this uh, lieutenant uh, Iago who uh, just envies him so much that he cre that Iago creates this um, all these like situations where you know Othello would would go crazy and like start to distrust everybody around him, and you know. Um, he, and, and ultimately, you know, Othello does end up going crazy. He uh, kills his wife, uh, Desdemona, and it's just, it's a tragedy. It's one of Shakespeare's tragedies. Um, so I can read uh, uh, the, a monologue from, you know, post-murder uh, uh, of start. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Behold, I have a weapon. A better never did itself... Never did itself... Sorry, <laughs> Ken. Um, no, it's all right. We got we got yeah. one on the phone as well, so you can get it together in the meantime. Yeah, get it but together. On, on, the, on the phone lines <laughs> at this time, we're going to make sure we have the boys' commentary again, 215-634-8065 or toll-free 1-866-361-0900. And on the phone lines at, at this time, we have B from Delaware. Welcome to the program, B. Thank you for waking up with Word. You're the last caller for the day. 
staying work with word. Good morning, Dr. Smith, Dr. Matera, and Queen Coesa and word family. I have enjoyed this year so immensely. We have learned, Dr. Montero, so, 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 so much from you. I think you suggested that bowling would be next. And we just want in the next two weeks for you just to tell us how you will enlighten us in 2019. I think there is no question that your reading today addresses our contemporary issues and compels us to look to how we are going to coalesce to get through where we are now. But there is no question that the madness that is now prevailing for how we govern and guide ourselves has to be informed by the message that you gave us today. But we are compelled to listen to those words and govern ourselves to act accordingly. We thank you so very much for this wonderful year. Well, thank you. I mean, I don't know that I'm doing all that much. I, I just want to say my, my dear twin, Jacob, he feels so bad that he forgot his lines. He got a little stage struck here. But we'll come back another time, and Jake and Serafina will do their thing. You'll be very impressed. But, yeah, B, you know, you know being able to elevate the intellectual and spiritual level of black folk is of central importance at this time in history. You know, we see a conspiracy all about us to dummy black folk down. Now, you know, this is not a small matter because black folk in the history of this country, as Du Bois in his history writings and in his sociological writings, has shown Black folk constitute the vanguard, the best hope, spiritually, intellectually, politically, culturally, for this nation, and in a large part for the world. And so, to dummy us down, to have us beset by a popular culture that is black in face and form, but not in content, uh, does great violence to us. So indeed, you know, reading Du Bois or reading Baldwin or hearing the songs of Nina Simone, uh, I like to also say Donna Washington and Billie Holiday, to, to know our history and our culture is of such great significance. So I just appreciate the opportunity to do this and I appreciate y'all being so kind to listen to me and encourage me. So thank you very, very much. And thank you all today for waking up with Word, all the people that called in for the Word on Business segment and also for the people who called in about the predictive program and that, uh, that assessment tool, that risk assessment tool that helped us to bring some more clarity to what we're facing and what we need to be vigilant about and work against. So shouts out to everybody who went downtown today to Filbert and shouts out to everybody who's just, you know, doing the best they can to do the right thing and not being, you know, Paralyzed by fear or indecision Because we got we got things to do We got work to do And we have a beautiful holiday season to celebrate We got a lot to be happy about One of the three independent black media outlets In the nation You are currently listening to that situation Up next with the source up next